Kenny and David Kim's groundbreaking idea was to create affordable fashion that spoke to urban youth. That's how South Pole, which was at one point one of the more popular brands in hip hop, was born and oddly enough at the hand of two Korean American brothers. It quickly matched up to the level of its renowned competitors and became more of a symbol and representation of young people in inner cities. The Kims got their start in the US when their family immigrated to New York from Incheon near Seoul in 1977. The unconventional transliteration of their surname traces to an earlier family presence in the US. David was the third eldest of the five Kim kids. He got a job at a Korean deli when he was 22 years old, but he later left the job and went to work for another Korean immigrant at his wholesale apparel company. In 1981, he took all of his savings of $10,000 and a $5,000 line of credit for merchandising his own brand and opened a retail men's clothing store in Brownsville. Brownsville, Brooklyn at that time was a pretty much entirely black neighborhood. Among them, there were half a dozen other Korean-owned stores on Brownsville's Pitkin Avenue at the time. David describes the situation as, Sometimes we heard gunshots. If delivery of our products left before dawn, there was a good chance it would disappear. But over time, David became friendly with his neighbors and sometimes he even gave them clothing or food. David describes it as, We could not focus on being the outsiders. We had to earn our respect. As the business was looking bright, David hired his younger brother Kenny to assist him. Kenny was a high school student then, and every day after school, Kenny worked as a messenger who carried inventory on the subway from wholesalers in Manhattan to the Brooklyn shop. Later in some interviews, Kenny mentioned that he was paid much less for the work he put in for his brother, saying, For all my hard work, he paid me $20 a week. But what could I do? He's my older brother, so I had to serve him. Kenny continued working for David through college at the mere salary of $20 a week. But when their Brooklyn landlord upped the rent in 1989, David decided to move his store to Jamaica, Queens, which was another predominantly black area. The shoppers at Queens were into urban clothing fashion. There was a huge demand for baggy jeans, but the Kims couldn't seem to stock them quickly enough. Apparently, other retailers in the area had the same problem. So in 1991, the brothers set up a wholesale business named Wicked Fashions and began sourcing denim from Pakistan specifically to fill this demand. A clothing revolution was brewing in the hip-hop community, and the Kims were in it with all they had. The adjoining Queens neighborhood of St. Albans and Hollis were home to many famous rappers, such as LL Cool J and Run DMC. Then a young waiter named Damon John began sewing hats with the label he created for FUBU. It was in Hollis in 1992 that the brand FUBU exploded and gave rise to one of the early lines of what would become a slew of hip-hop brands. FUBU also had hybrid origins and received backing from Samsung Textiles. Behind the scenes, the Koreans provided the budding FUBU with production and distribution channels. But black Korean tensions began boiling at the same time with New York and especially Los Angeles when we saw certain riots. But the Kims kept the faith based on the fact that they'll eventually become US citizens. David said, We just kept our heads down and kept working hard. As demand for oversized sweatshirts and t-shirts grew in the locality, David saw the opportunity to market his label to a broader audience. He named it South Pole. The naming of the brand was an apparent act of Korean patriotism as the first Korean team to reach the South Pole several years earlier. South Pole initially mimicked styles that were seen on the street and sold them for less than the celebrated hip-hop brands. The Kims conducted their own market research in addition to watching what their customers wanted. On one trip to Harlem, Kenny spotted a young black man wearing what appeared to be a down-filled puffy jacket. They took note of the jacket so it could be reproduced with the South Pole label. When the Kims knew that factories in Hong Kong were big at that time, they spread out their photographs and sample clothing purchases, explaining in painstaking detail what they wanted. But logically enough, they didn't use manufacturers in Korea, since by that time, the rise of labor unions had made it too troublesome and expensive to make clothing there. Kenny had his own ambition to start a mall-based chain of retail stores, selling nothing but hip-hop clothing all along. But he decided to stay loyal to his brother's business and had promised David that he'd stick with South Pole for five years, describing it as, People said to me, are you crazy? You're already successful. I was a big shot in charge of designing, manufacturing, and bringing all the products in. I was a vice president, but South Pole was David's dream, not mine. Kenny left for a minimum wage clerk job at a men's clothier in New Jersey Mall saying, I had to learn this business from the inside out. After five months of ringing up customers and folding sweaters for his brother, Kenny decided to set up a chain of mall-based retail stores focusing on urban street fashion called Against All Odds. He used his savings for rent money. 
David gave him South Pole merchandise with extended credit lines to support his business. It was two months for other buyers and six months for Kenny. At that time in 1996, Kenny said, there were no mall-based hip hop stores. He set up shop at another New Jersey mall. But at this point, Kenny faced some issues with the local mall. Kenny describes the mall situation as, the mall was pathetic. I realized pretty quickly that nobody shopped there. You could roll a bowling ball down the walkway and the chance of hitting somebody was zero. This was my first learning stage. Kenny had to lure shoppers initially. There was some competition because another mall about a mile away routinely drew crowds. But for Kenny, the lease needed to be lowered. So he made up thousands of flyers which had the announcement of 10% off everything in the store. And he left them on car windshields in the other mall's parking lot. Soon, against all odds, had the foot traffic that Kenny sought. That wasn't all. Kenny had done everything to make his business flourish by cutting his costs in every way possible. He was sleeping at one of his stores. He cut his living expenses to almost zero. He recalled the situation back then saying, I had no rent, but my parents were a little worried. For promotional ideas, Kenny brainstormed and observed what others around him were doing. One of his Canadian friends told him that the day after Christmas, which is called Boxing Day, was the biggest shopping day in the malls. Kenny saw a sale opportunity and he grabbed onto it by bribing the mall security guards with dinner on Christmas Eve. He persuaded them not to kick him out that night because he needed the night to set things up. Kenny worked feverishly to rearrange the merchandise in the store, staying up all night and much of Christmas to get the work done, and made big posters that read, Boxing Day Sale. Kenny said while describing his situation now, I did get some traffic that day, and a lot of confused people asked about Boxing Day was. Most people wanted to make returns. But the customers kept coming back to his store, partially because Boxing Day isn't really a U.S. holiday. His older brother David also wasn't far away from success. Eno Park was president of the U.S. operations of Samsung's Chail Industries, which was a chemicals and textiles company headquartered in New Jersey before he joined David as South Pole's development manager. He described his experience as, David is quiet and shy and is not eloquent, but his way of thinking is extraordinary. He never stops challenging himself. He set seemingly impossible goals. One of them was to make one billion in sales by 2010. It sounds impossible, but I think it's achievable. In 2001, South Pole transitioned from a premium brand to a mid-tier brand and entered JCPenney, and also got picked up by Sears for the first time. Back then, the South Pole brand had pulled at least even with FUBU and sold through Sears, JCPenney, who were America's really big department stores. South Pole was JCPenney's strongest national brand in the young men's category. A chain spokeswoman from South Pole said that, the popularity of South Pole among teens prompted us to expand the brand to teenage girls and kids. South Pole spent 3% of its revenues on marketing, which is a touch higher than its competitors, although they didn't have a celebrity to show off, which would take paid promotions. David developed a new line called Lot 29. It was developed with Warner Brothers, and the clothes featured embroidered images of cartoon characters such as Tweety Bird. These higher margin items were sold via different distribution channels than the South Pole branded goods. Lot 29's face at the time was Puerto Rican model Jasmine Gonzalez. She described her appearance saying, Lot 29 approached me after I won America's Next Top Model and has been a fantastic experience ever since. They offered me the opportunity to become the new face of Lot 29 and I gladly accepted. I believe that everything that comes my way is a result of divine intervention and I feel blessed to showcase my skills in their clothes. In 2003, South Pole expanded its reach by signing a distribution license in Japan with Wise Harvest. The following year in 2004, David Kim was recognized as Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year. 2005 was the year when South Pole decided to collaborate with artists for promotional purposes. They enlisted pop star Sierra for their Junior's advertising campaign, further elevating the brand's visibility. As their focus turned towards accessories, South Pole started introducing handbags, footwear, headwear, and cold weather accessories to complement their clothing offerings. Marketing efforts in 2007 led South Pole to sponsor an outfield billboard at Shea Stadium, which was the former home of the New York Mets. It solidified their presence in the sports and entertainment landscape, which was missing up until then. South Pole launched the White Tag brand and the A Prodigy brand in 2008 to help and try to expand their brand portfolio. They secured a license for infant and toddler apparel the same year and tapped into the market for young children's fashion. Unfortunately, after the financial crisis hit in 2008, there were severe challenges for the retail industry. Against all odds, open stores in California just before the crisis and subsequently fired for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in January of 2009. However, they emerged from bankruptcy in December of the same year and continued to operate stores along the East Coast. 
In 2009, South Pole launched the RS by Ryan Sheckler brand, but ultimately shuttered it the following year in 2010. That same year, the WT-02 brand, which was introduced, that expanded South Pole's offerings. By 2010, South Pole had become the fifth largest denim brand in the United States, ranking behind Levi's, Wrangler, Lee, and Calvin Klein, according to NPD Group figures. In 2011, South Pole launched its Speak Up, Step Up anti-bullying campaign, using its platform to address social issues. Additionally, the brand revamped its website from a business-to-business -business format to a consumer-oriented branding site, aiming to provide an enhanced experience for customers to directly buy from them. Kenny describes his ideology about urban fashion by saying, In our definition, the term urban does not equal hip-hop. Urban is a much larger realm that may encompass hip-hop. It's a widely accepted misconception to correlate urban fashion with hip-hop, but we think otherwise. Despite being a massively recognized brand, South Pole has been struggling in recent years. In 2019, the company filed for bankruptcy once again and was subsequently acquired by Authentic Brands Group. Since then, South Pole has been working to rebuild its brand and regain footing within the industry. And there are several reasons for South Pole's decline. One reason is that the company's target market has changed severely over the past two decades. In the early 2000s, South Pole was popular with young people who were interested in hip hop culture or grew up with hip hop culture. However, as that demographic has aged, South Pole has struggled to keep up with their changing tastes and recruiting new people with the new younger fashion styles. Another reason for South Pole's decline is the company's been slow to adapt to the changing retail landscape. Consumers had been increasingly shopping online, and South Pole wasn't really able to keep up with the shift to e-commerce, and its brick-and-mortar stores have struggled since. But the brand is starting to grow out of the challenges with some new business developments, or they're at least trying to. They launched a new website and have expanded their product line. South Pole has also partnered with several celebrities and influencers in an effort to boost its brand awareness. The company has tried to take some steps in the right direction since then, but it's unlikely that this brand is ever going to grow. And in most of our hearts, it really just holds a sentimental, nostalgic piece of memory. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. And make sure to subscribe for more.